Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rabbi Chaim Brook from the Chabad of Sisan. On behalf of Chabad, I'm privileged to welcome you to this very historic event. Before we begin our program tonight, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the many student volunteers who have given tirelessly hours to prepare for this event. Um, all the volunteers, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank I would also like to thank the co-sponsors of tonight's event. First and foremost, the Office of the Provost, Dr. Hellenbrand, and his office for co-sponsoring tonight, together with Chabad of Northridge, Hillel 818, the Jewish Fraternity A. Pi, and the Jewish Sorority GAT. Thank you all. The CSUN community and the North Valley community as a whole is honored to host Mrs. Schloss tonight. She's here from London, England. She's finishing an exhausting tour, speaking tour, in California for the first time, where she, is, has, she has inspired many thousands of people who have come together at more than 10 Chabad centers throughout the state. So tonight is her last talk in California. And uh, we're very honored that you're here with us tonight. We'll begin our program tonight. I know we're a little bit late, but we'll, have, we'll start first with a brief memorial service honoring the righteous souls of the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. We will begin with a special melody that was composed during the Holocaust. After the video, Cantor Rabbi Yassi Gordon will lead us in the singing of Ani Ma'amin. Please direct your attention now to the video screen. Lights, please. <laughs> Dark clouds began to cover the skies of Europe, the clouds of Nazism. And as they invaded Warsaw, they moved Jews, men, women, and children into the ghettos. Slowly, over time, the ghettos began to empty. Even the birds stopped singing, as if they knew what came next. The trains of doom filled with the innocent and the pure, carrying them to their deaths. And it was on one such train headed to the death camp Treblinka, in the midst of the terror, the gasping, the weeping, and the despair, that a lone voice was heard singing. His name was Azriel David Fasting, the cantor of the saintly Moznitzer Rebbe, Rabbi Shaul Yedidja Elisar. People thought he had lost his mind, but Azriel's heavenly and sweet voice continued its soulful tune. There he was, face aglow, eyes squeezed tight with concentration fixated upon the words of one of the 13 principles of the Jewish faith, Ani Ma'amin, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of Moshiach, the final redemption. Gradually, the hundreds of listening ears joined his song, at first quietly, but slowly growing louder and louder. Soon the song spread from car to car, and every mouth that could still draw a breath joined in Azriel's haunting melody, Anima Amin. His eyes red from crying and his cheeks wet with tears. Cantor Fostig tore a piece off of his own shirt and jotted down the notes of his new composition. There he proclaimed, I will give half my share in the world to come to the person who will take my song to my saintly teacher, the Mosnitsa Rebbe, who had escaped to the shores of the United States. A hushed silence descended upon the train, and two young men appeared, promising to bring the song to the Rebbe at any cost. Bidding farewell to their brothers and sisters, they jumped out of a hole they broke in the train's roof. One miraculously survived, and clutching dearly to the shirt, kept the melody alive. It was on Yom Kippur, just after the war, on the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, 
and the Mosnitzer Rebbe's synagogue in New York was filled with thousands upon thousands. As the Rebbe began singing the Anima Amin, the crowd wept bitterly, swaying back and forth as if in a different world. He trembled and declared, On their journey to the gas chambers, this song was born from the ashes of millions, and it will be with this song that the Jewish people will march as they greet Moshiach, the final redemption. We're going to sing the song now. Anyone would like to sing with me, feel free to sing along. Anima min, anima min, anima min. Be'yemuna she'le'yemo. Hamoshiach, Beviyas Hamoshiach, Ani Mahamin, Beviyas Hamoshiach, Beviyas Hamoshiach, Ani Mahamin. Again, everyone together now. Ani Mahamin, Ani. Thank you, Rabbi Yossi. At this time, I would like to invite the director of Chabad of Northridge, Rabbi Eli Rifkin, who has been very instrumental in establishing the Chabad at Sisan some eight years ago, and since then until today has been a constant support for our organization to please come and introduce our speaker. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I'd like to thank Chabad of Sisan and Rabbi Chaim and Rabbi Tzin Rezel Brook and all of their wonderful volunteers and staff for putting together this beautiful, beautiful evening. It's very appropriate that Chabad at Sisan is hosting such, a, such an inspirational evening with our wonderful guests. A number of years ago, in the mid-50s, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Schneerson, the leader of Chabad, was approached by the leaders of the federations of the United States with a beautiful idea with which to remember the six million who perished during the Holocaust. They said to the Rebbe, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing, a very special thing, if we encouraged families as they gather together for their Passover Seder, for the Pesach Seder, as we celebrate our freedom, wouldn't it be meaningful if we encouraged everyone to leave one chair empty at the table as a sign for the millions who were lost during the Holocaust? And the Rebbe answered, truly a very special idea, very meaningful idea. 
but perhaps I can suggest something else. The Rebbe said, let's encourage every Jewish family as they invite their family and friends to add one more chair to the table, but don't leave it empty. Find a Jew who would not come to the Seder and have them sit in that chair. And the Rebbe said, in that way, we guarantee forever that those who were perished in the Holocaust, their memories will never be lost. Because when we have Jews who identify proudly as Jews, that is the strongest way to combat this terrible reality that we're seeing growing in the world, where as we have people, as Mrs. Schloss and many thousands of others, who themselves witnessed the horror, people have the chutzpah in growing numbers around the world to say it didn't happen. The only way we can fight that is by having many, many Jews, proud Jews, young Jews, who are Jewish and who talk about Jewish history and who are proud to live as Jews. And that is exactly what Chabad of Sisan does day in and day out, 24-7. And so it's very, very special and very appropriate that it is the Chabad of Sisan who's hosting this event here tonight. Before I ask Mrs. Schloss to come up for our very special evening, we'd like to light candles, six candles, one for each of the six million Jews, not six million candles, although that would certainly be appropriate. Six candles we're going to light tonight. We're going to ask a number of students of CSUN who are very active with Chabad to please come up and to light the candles. We'd like to invite Sandra Brahm, Susie Wilson, Cynthia Mazuz, Jackie Schwecki, and Sean Shevach to please come up. And each of you, please light one of the candles. Please rise as we do so, and we remember those who were lost. <coughs> Please remain standing and repeat after me. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Please be seated. Thank you. At this time, it's truly an honor and a privilege. We're humbled to welcome our guest speaker tonight. Mrs. Schloss, as Rabbi Brooke mentioned, has traveled here all the way from London, England. She spent over two weeks traveling the entire state, speaking to literally thousands of people, uplifting them, inspiring them. And it's such an honor to have her here tonight. Any Holocaust survivor is special and unique and worthy of our honor. How much more so when we talk about someone who is kind enough to travel the world and share her story. And what a story it is. A story about her own life, a story about her childhood friend, the renowned Anne Frank. Instead of me telling you her story, why don't we invite Mrs. Eva Schloss to please come up and share with us your story. <laughs>
Mrs. Schloss is a very uh, humble individual, and instead of getting up and lecturing, she prefers to be part of a conversation. That's right. And yes. so we'll have a conversation, and if anybody wants to listen, they're welcome to. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't come here just to uh, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you move the mic closer a little bit? Okay. So perhaps we can begin with your childhood. Um, I understand that you grew up in several cities throughout Europe, and eventually you ended up in Amsterdam as a small child. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. Um, I grew up in Vienna. I was born in 1929. I had an older brother, parents who married very young. My mother was 18, my father was 21. Um, my father inherited a shoe factory from his father. Um, we had grandparents, aunt, uncle, cousins, a very big extended family. And Austria and Vienna is a beautiful country and a beautiful city with a lot of things going on. And um, I grew up um, with my father doing very sporty things. We were very keen on skiing and mountaineering and swimming. And so every weekend we went out into the mountains and in winter we went skiing. Um, my father was one of the few people who had in the early 30s already a car. Uh, he did um, dangerous mountain trips because the roads were not really meant for cars at the time. My mother sat in the back of the car screaming at every bend. But um, my father and me really enjoyed that. My brother was more like my mother, more, uh, um, a bit more scared to all those things. But I was really quite... Um, more, um, more, I was really more the boy in the family, and my brother was more a gentle, gentle character. Um, we were very, very happy there, but um, in my ninth year, things changed dramatically. It was um, Hitler annexed Austria, and things immediately started. There was anti-Semitism anti in Austria, like unfortunately everywhere, but it was dormant. We didn't really notice it. My, my parents had many, many non-Jewish friends. I went to an ordinary school. But what is important on the continent, you had to have religious education, not like in America where this is not done in schools. So um, Austria was a Catholic country, so most children were Catholic. But the Jewish children were taken out of their class. We were eight Jewish children in our class, and we had three times a week um, Jewish education. It was perfectly all right. It was not um, a discrimination. But this, of course, meant that when Hitler came and when anti-Semitism became really dangerous, um, everybody knew in the school who was a Jew. And my first anti-Semitic experience was when I went um, after school one afternoon to my best friend who was Catholic and I went there very regularly, it was on the way home. Um, the mother opened the door and when she saw me, she said, you're not welcome here anymore and she slammed the door in my face. Um, I didn't understand, I went home crying, I said to my parents, I can't understand, we didn't have a quarrel. And my parents made me understand that from now on, life is going to be very, very tough if you were a Jew. And indeed, it became really, really, very, very difficult. The mentality of the Austrian changed really overnight. My brother, too, he was um, 12 years old at the time. He went to school. He came home all beaten up by his own friends, and the teacher watched. So this was the situation. I understand you met Anne Frank before the war, before the Nazis invaded. Um, Can you tell just, us a bit about your connection with her? Um, well, not really. Um, um, just actually a few months. Um, we were lucky enough to get out of the country. And this was really the big tragedy that most people in Germany, in Austria, in Czechoslovakia, Poland, didn't get visas anywhere in the world to have a safe place. So, um, as I say, we were lucky. We were eventually able to go to Holland, to Amsterdam. We settled there on a big square, the Mervedeplein, and um, there was rather small apartments, but modern, very, very comfortable. And my father hired a furnished apartment belonging to a Christian. So um, this is quite important because afterwards, when we came back, we could go back there. 
Um, there was a piano, and Heinz was very, very musical. He, um, Heinz Heinz is your brother? Heinz was my brother. Um, <clears throat> he was very, very talented. He could play anything by ear on the piano. He could play um, Rhapsody in Blue from Gershwin by heart, which is a very difficult piece of music. He had an accordion, had a guitar, and um, it was very nice in Holland. The people said, um, you don't have to be afraid, we are quite safe here. Um, I made many, many friends, and I was very happy. But it didn't last very long. In, in May, one night, we woke up and we heard aeroplanes and um, guns, and we looked out and we saw um, uh, searchlights, and we put on the radio, and it said, terrible news, the Germans are invading, trying to invade our country. There was a very short war, five days, they bombarded Rotterdam, which is the second biggest city, and they said, if you are not giving in, we are going to bombard all your cities. The royal um, family left, escaped first to England and then to Canada, and that kind of dispirited the Dutch people, and they gave up after five days. And we still tried to get a boat to um, England, but when we got to the harbor, the last boat had gone, and um, we went back to our apartment and thought, well, we see what is going to happen now. There was no escape anymore. Um, and um, <coughs> so that was in, um, in May 1940. Before that, um, as I say, all the children went out to play, and one day a little girl came to me, um, we were both 11 years old, and she said, my name is Anne Frank, and my family come from Germany, and come to my apartment to meet my father and mother, they can speak German to you. Well, I'd just been in the country for three months, and um, didn't speak Dutch that well, and I was very pleased to have somebody to speak German. And so I met the family, not expecting, of course, that Otto Frank would later become my stepfather. Um, Anne, um, I met daily um, in the square playing, but we were definitely not best friends. She was quite a different type from me. As I said, I was sort of a tomboy. I liked to play rounders and tricks on the bicycle, and um, I had a brother, so we were always really more with the boys. But Anne um, was um, quite interested in her hairstyle, in fashion, in film stars. She always looked at magazine. And she, I had become quite shy because before we were in Belgium and I was kind of um, put down and, you know, I lost a bit of my confidence. But Anne was quite sure of herself. She always wanted to be the center of attention. She was already a big flirt. She liked to have a boyfriend and change them very often. She was bored with this one and with that one. When I told her I had an older brother, her eyes grow very big, <laughs> and um, wondering who he was, and perhaps he can become her boyfriend as well. Um, so, um, <clears throat> as well, she was um, a big chatterbox. Um, her nickname was Mrs. Quack Quack. And um, she had to stay behind very often in school to write lines. I'm not going to talk so much in class. But she still kept on talking. And um, she was quite a show, showman girl. She sat on the steps from our apartments and told stories. And as well, she could get her shoulder out of her socket. And she made kind of a circus a performance out of that. Oh, watch me now. I'm going to do the most famous trick. And there she did bring and did make a knack, and everybody had to clap, and then she put it back again. And um, a friend of her, um, um, a mother of her friend said, God knows everything, but Anna knows everything better. <laughs> um, so um, we knew each other for two years, from 1940 to 1942, when both families went to hiding. But, of course, in those two, two years, the Nazis made um, life for Jewish people very, very difficult. Um, do you want to ask me something again, or shall I carry on? <laughs> I think you're doing a great job. Perhaps you can tell us more about what it was like well, going into hiding. Um, yes. Well, I'll first tell a little bit about the uh, two years of occupation. You know, um, 
it's not like in Austria, the Dutch were not anti-Semitic and so they went really very, very careful to make the measures not too much in one go. And so slowly, slowly, uh, we were not allowed on public transport where we all had bicycles. We were not to, allowed to go to the cinema or theater or concerts. Well, we could do without it. Um, we were not allowed to have a radio. We all had to end in radios. Then we had to end in our bicycles. That became already more difficult. Then we had to wear a yellow star for identification. And by itself, of course, it wasn't so bad. We were very proud, we were Jews, and it was a star. But what they did was they um, cordoned off a part of Amsterdam, and every Jewish boy and man who was in this part of Amsterdam was arrested and sent to nobody knew. But never anybody heard of those people. Only after the war did we hear they were sent to Mauthausen, which is a horrific Austrian death camp, and they were just thrown down from the cliffs. But at that time we didn't know that. But the Dutch, um, as a sign of support for us, had a general strike, um, meaning that nothing functioned. But um, the Germans knew how to handle that. They took hostages from the street, ordinary Dutch citizens, and said, if um, not, you are not going assuming work immediately, we are going to start shooting those hostages. So you can imagine people went back to work. But at that time, we felt we really had support from the local population. But um, after two years, um, <clears throat> Many, many young people, my brother Heinz and Anne Sister Margot, and many, many of their friends, from about 15 to 25, got a call-up notice to um, get ready with a backpack to be deported to Germany to work in a factory. Well, you know, um, many German men had been in the army, and many Jewish parents thought, well, they need young people, strong people, to work in the factories, and they sent their children. And again, those children were never, ever heard of, and only after the war did we hear again, they were sent to Mauthausen and then killed there. In the Dutch have there a big, big monument. If ever you visit Mauthausen, there's a big, big monument um, for all this early murdering of those, of those young people. But that was a point where many, many other families decided they wouldn't send their kids and we would go into hiding. One day my father said, um, you know, Hans is not going and we're going into hiding. And I said, hiding, what do you mean, hiding? You know, we played hide and seek, but hiding to go, we, we couldn't really comprehend what this meant. And my father explained, we are going to stay with brave Dutch people who had the courage to help us, and from now on, you are going to be invisible. You are not going to go out, you have to be quiet, but it won't be long, probably till the end of the year. The war won't take that long. By that time, America had been in the war already, and the hope was that the war was going to end very, very quickly but it didn't end for another three years. So um, the Dutch apartments are quite small, so nobody wanted to take in a family of four, so we had to split up. My mother went with me, and Heinz went with my father. My father said as well, if we split up, the chance that at least two of us will survive is bigger. So at that time, he already realized that perhaps we won't survive. Um, as I told you, I was not a very studious child at the time. I was really more an outdoor a child, a sporty person. And for me to sit still day in, day out, um, when the teacher, people where we were hiding worked, so they went out so from then on in the morning, we had to sit still. We had the table, we put our lunch there, um, and as well a potty because we couldn't go to the toilet. and. Um, we took a book, and my mother took some knitting, and there we sat, day in, day out, day in, day out. I loved my mother, we got on very well, but you know, what can you talk about if you have no um, outside experiences? My mother tried to teach me some lessons, but um, I didn't like it what she told me, so she lost her temper with me, so she gave me some smacks, and um, 
I got, I got aggravated, and so, you know, so we gave it up again. And as I say, I didn't like reading at the time, so boredom was unbelievable. But as well, um, the, the Nazis knew people had disappeared, and they really wanted to catch every Jew. So they made house searches. So um, the people from the resistance came to look over their apartments and said, well, I think we can make a false partition here or build a wall here or perhaps <coughs> under the floorboards. So at night, when we were in bed, we heard knocking on the door, shouting outside, and the Christian people had to open the door and let the Nazis in, and they stormed up and searched everywhere. So we were in this hiding place hoping they wouldn't find us. And you can imagine if this happened about once a week, you don't sleep very well, you're nervous. And then we heard the story that they came in another house and um, at night and the people um, quickly went in their secret hiding place, but they felt the beds, which were still warm. So they demolished the whole apartment till they found the people and even the people who hit the, the Christian people were arrested and sent to camps. So of course hiding became more and more difficult. People said, I'm sorry I can't take the tension any longer. You have to find for different hiding places. So we were for two years in hiding, and my father and brother as well, they were actually in the country. And um, the woman where they were staying started to blackmail them for more money. Um, you have to pay, you know, the general cost for your food and for other things, but some people did it for money and asked much more money. And this woman, she said in 1944, perhaps the war will end, so she wanted to build up a nest egg, and she asked an outrageous sum of money. Um, after two years in hiding, we ran out of money. My mother had still a little bit of jewelry, which we sold, and my father phoned my mother desperately and said, please find us another place. It was difficult in 44, many Dutch people had gone into hiding as well, and eventually a Dutch nurse came forward and said she knows a safe house. My father and brother escaped at night from this woman and met, was met by this nurse, and she took them um, to the safe house. Um, it was a Sunday, and it was very near where my mother and me were hiding. So on the Sunday afternoon, we went to visit them. And on Tuesday morning, it was my 15th birthday, and we had just been a few days in this new hiding place, and um, we went down to breakfast, and we heard a knock on the door, and the owner of the house went down to open the door, and the Nazis stormed in and took us away. My mother still said we are not Jewish, and we are just visiting, but they knew who we were, because this nurse, this Dutch nurse was really a double agent. She really worked for the Nazis and uh, pretended to work for the resistance. Her boyfriend was a member of the resistance and he always asked her for safe houses and she always had it. And um, um, sometimes he wanted to give a letter and meet somebody if the parents were hiding and the children wanted to get in touch. And she always said, you can't get in touch with those people. And so he became suspicious of her. And um, she realized that, that he was suspicious, so she denounced him and he was arrested and immediately shot. shot. So you can imagine what kind of people those were. After the war, there was a court case against her, but she only got four years. But she betrayed more than 200 people. Um, now, uh, so you were caught together with your father and brother? Together, Everyone right. together? Yes. Did your father or brother have a chance to share with you what their hiding was like? Um, well, we knew because we were, my mother and me went occasionally out. We had a false ID papers and we really looked very Dutch. So we sometimes took the chance. But my father and brother, my brother was dark haired and they actually never went out, only when they had to change hiding places. So we knew. But in hiding, my brother, if you have a chance later, you can see there, um, he, um, I told you he was really a musician, but in hiding he had to be very, very quiet and um, so he couldn't make any music, so he tried another of his talents and um, he made some paintings. 
and um, 30 paintings he did in hiding from, from 16 years till 17 and a half and um, we were able to bring nine of them here with a bit of the history. And um, when we were traveling in the cattle truck, that was the last time I saw my brother, he told me that they had hidden those paintings um, under the floor but in this house where they escaped. And with a little note on top where it says, um, Sales belongs to Heinz and Eric Geringer and after the war we are going to come and pick it up again. So after they caught you, after you were taken by the Nazis, what, what happened next? Were you taken to a concentration camp? Um, well, first one day in a prison, and the next day we were taken to the big holding camp in Holland called Westerborg. And um, we came, arrived there on a Wednesday, and on Friday we were already put on a list to be deported to the East. Well, Holland is the most western country, and East was bad news. Um, there were over 300 deaths and labor camps in, in, in concentration camps in Germany and Poland. Some were labor camps, and of course they never told you where you were going. So when we were taken, we had still some hope, perhaps we were going to a labor camp. But as I said, it was the last time we were together as a family. And my father, who was a very wonderful family man, he apologized to us that from now on he can't protect us anymore. He said, I took you out of Austria, I found you a hiding place, but from now on I'd be, it'd be hopeless, I can't do anything. You have to really look after yourself from now. He told us um, we always have to try to be clean so that we don't get sickness. Always try to wash your hands. And later I had to, in the terrible situation, I had to smile how innocent my father thought things might be. Stay clean. Clear, right. yeah. So the last time you saw your father and brother was on the train? Um, my father I actually did see a couple of times. My brother I never ever saw again. And, and which camp did they bring you to? Um, well, we traveled in terrible circumstances in, in boxcars with just a little slit of air and um, there was nothing in it. There was not enough room for people to sit all the time, so most people had to stand. Um, there was just a bucket, two buckets, one for water, one to be used for toilets. Um, once a day, the doors, were, the, the doors opened and bread was thrown in, like feeding wild animals. And so eventually the train stopped, and the doors were pulled open, and we heard shouting, raus, raus, out of the truck, and we jumped down, and we stretched, and it was a beautiful day with blue sky, and uh, we looked around, and it was a platform, and we saw a big sign, Auschwitz, Auschwitz in. And we did know this was the biggest death camp. You did know? We did know. How did you know? Um, while we were in, in hiding, the people, um, everybody wanted to know the real news, how the war was going. The Germans only told how they were winning the war, the battles they were winning. But um, the British, the BBC sent broadcast out to all the occupied countries in Europe. and. Um, it always started, I remember it very, very clearly. It started with da 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 da, da 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 da. That is the BBC from London giving you news of the war. And they told, of course, by 44, um, the uh, Germans were already defeated in Africa, the Russians were already defeating the Germans in the East, and um, um, an invasion was planned. Um, when we were arrested, there was no invasion yet. But um, they told us a planning one, and um, but they always, always told us about the death camps in Germany and Poland, and by always mentioning Auschwitz, where be people were systematically being gassed. So when we saw this sign, we started to think, well, perhaps our last hour on earth had approached. But the next command was men and women to different sides. 
So um, you can't imagine the screaming, the crying, the howling, the wailing um, of people um, trying to cling on to their male members and to their sons and the fathers to their daughters and wives. And um, it was a horrible scene. And eventually the Germans beat us apart and the men walked away. And most women never saw their husband or their husband or both people were killed. Um, I had a miraculous escape. I was really one of the youngest people on this transport. And um, my mother gave me, um, we really thought we were going to be killed, but nevertheless, my mother gave me a head and coat. And this head had quite a big rim. And so when Dr. Mengele, that was the camp doctor, you might have heard the name, he was, uh, the nickname was Dr. Death, because he decided um, between life and death. So he came to every row, looked you over, and said, this side or this side. At that time, of course, we didn't quite realize what those two different sides meant. But when he looked at me and my mother, he sent me to one side. The other side, mainly um, children, um, babies, of course, and older people. He didn't ask the age, but how you looked. So if you were 50 and you looked sort of tired and a bit gray from the journey, you still went to the other side. You might have been 60 and you looked quite well, you might have got into the camp. So it just depended on your looks. And um, so we marched into the camp and um, we were taken into a huge barrack. The next command was undressed completely naked. And the Nazis were walking around there, laughing how embarrassed we were and poking at us. And um, then we had to um, go in front of a big table where we had to give our name, our age, our, where we came from. And then we were all tattooed. And we were told, you're not a human being, not a mensch anymore. You are like cattle who is stamped. And if ever we want you, we only will call you out by your number, never by your name. Forget you're a human being. Then all our hair was shaved. And while this was taken on, I mean, we were a few hundred people, um, took a long, long time, they told us, the family you have been separated from, um, were told they were going to have a shower. And they went into a barrack, and there were um, pipes and shower heads, and they stood there waiting after this terrible journey, they're looking forward to have a wash. And, um, they looked up, nothing happened, no water came, and they waited, they stood there, waiting, nothing. Then they started to have breathing difficulties, and they started to feel faint, and they couldn't breathe anymore, she fell to the floor, and within 10 minutes, everybody was dead. Because through those pipes, Cyclone B, poisonous gas had been entered, which was um, manufactured in Auschwitz, and this went on 24 hours a day, every day, every Sunday, every, all the time. And they told us, so you can imagine how a mother felt who had just given up her child or a daughter who had lost her mother. And they loved telling us terrible things. The cruelty was just indescribable. And not just from the Germans. There were couples, those were mainly Polish prisoners, very often. Um, from prisons, murderers, who were there already early, they had already built the camp, and they said, well, you were still in comfort at home, we were already here, and now we are going to make you suffer. Um, the, the Nazis organized the camp, but they really didn't have anything to do with us. They did the selection, they gave the orders what to do, but it was the couples, really, who ran the camp. Did you stay together with your mother in Auschwitz? Um, for a while we were together, and that of course was one of the things which really helped me to survive a little longer. Um, but one day a terrible thing happened. Um, it was about, um, of course we never knew what day it was or even what month, only through the season we knew. But it was already pretty cold, it must have been October. Um, we had to go to a shower. Once a week, usually, we went to a shower. Washing during the week was practically impossible. And we were full of lice. 
and we had one garment, that was it. And um, when we went to a shower, we left uh, but we, our old garment we left behind and when we came out we got a new garment. Just one dress or a coat, never any underwear, um, two shoes, never a pair, and um, of course never something which fitted you. And when you had to run, sometimes you lost a shoe and you couldn't stop to pick it up. So you sometimes you were with one shoe or sometimes without shoe till a week till you were able to go to a shower. So it was always a great good day when we went to a shower. But when we came out of the shower, there stood Mengele with a lot of the Nazis and the selection was taking place. And um, I passed him and my mother, like any mother would do, had given me very often part of her bread ration. And she was quite a tall lady and she had become indeed really very, very thin. And um, with shaved head, you know, we didn't look very nice. So um, I passed and then my mother went behind me and he looked her over and he sent her to another side. With 40 women that night, um, they were taken out and they were taken to the gas chambers. And um, so at that time, we were moving to a different part of the camp, still Birkenau, but um, you know, there were many, many camps, A, B, C, D, everything surrounded with watchtowers and electrified barbed wire. And new arrivals always went to a new part of the camp because they didn't want us to know what was going on outside. So we were moved to a different part and um, I assumed my mother had been killed. And um, you want to ask me something? So, so what ended up happening to your mother? Um, well, um, I didn't know, but um, this is a long story. Um, you know my mother married Otto Frank, so she obviously wasn't killed. Um, in my book, Eva's Story, she writes two chapters, and one of them is when she was um, selected, what happened to her. And one of the things, she was 40 years old, and she told me always, you know, um, I accepted that my life is finished, I'm going to die now, but she prayed that at least her children would survive. But she was miraculously saved. As I say in my book, she describes this in great detail, exactly what happened. And, um, but I didn't know. And um, after a couple of months, I was, um, I must say, it came winter, it was very, very cold. I was very disheartened. Um, I nearly gave up. I had terrible frostbite on my feet. I could practically not walk. And, um, I had a friend who kind of kept my spirit up, but you know, to be without my mother, not knowing if my father and brother is still alive, um, it was this was for me a very, very hard time. But I still held on. And one day, um, I was working in a barrack, and um, a couple came in and said, "You're wanted outside," and I didn't want to go because it's always bad news. But I had to go, and I went outside and a miracle had happened, there stood my father with his SS boss. Um, he looked terrible, very sunken, and um, the striped uniform, and um, Barrett, we didn't wear the striped uniform, which was actually better clothes, because it was good, good clothes. But um, we just had rags, but my father had this, because he went obviously outside the camp to work, and um, he told me Heinz was still all right, and the first question he asked me, where is Muti, where is your mom? And I said, and I burst into tears and said she had been gassed. You should have seen my father's face. He was, he, it was terrible news for him. But he told me, well, hold on, hold on, we are still, we are still alive. Soon the war will end, we'll, we'll make it, and um, we'll, Muti will, will be, she will be in our souls. And um, he left again. And um, then after several weeks, some people from our Dutch transport, the Nazis um, 
became very nervous because the Russians were approaching and we did her guns and sometimes aeroplane and then the Nazis took every day the emptied barracks and took people away from Auschwitz and um, we didn't know of course where they were going or what happened and um, later after the war those were called the death marches because most people perished you can imagine in midwinter practically without food um, walking a day in, day out, very weak, very cold, people just fell by the roadside. Many, many were shot and very few really survived, survived that. But we didn't know anything of that, of course, at that time. And the rumor had been spread when the Nazis were leaving the camp, when the Russians were coming, so they were going to uh, burn the barracks down with the inmates who are still there inside. So nobody, of course, wanted to be burned alive. So most people even volunteered to go out with the Nazis um, somewhere. And um, again, by great, great luck, my mother and me didn't go. Um, again, that's very much described. It was not as easy as I explained it, but it was quite a complicated uh, issue. Um, we stayed behind. And one day in January, um, we woke up and it was really very, very quiet and we went outside, no shouting, no, um, no, no SS, nobody walking around and we realized they had fled with taking most of the inmates with them in the night. And the gates was open, we could literally have gone out but you know we didn't dare, we were very, very weak, it was extremely cold and so we stayed behind not really knowing what was going to happen. And one day I walked around again and um, I saw at the gate with, where was a few other people, I saw a huge creature, um, all with icicles and, and fur and hairy and things. And from the distance first I thought it was a bear. But when I looked closely I realized it was a man and it turned out to be a Russian soldier, a scout who was to investigate what was coming before the army was following. And um, we went to him and we took him in the barrack and he explained, um, there were Polish people and they could talk to each other, that um, he was just investigating, he has to go back, he can't help us, but more Russians will come. And a um, few days later, um, loads of Russian came with horses and tanks and the field kitchen. And they were going to stay the night and they cooked um, a meal for the soldiers, but as well for us. They gave us big bowls with some um, wonderful cabbage soup. It was uh, tasted beautiful, um, it was very greasy, had a lot of fatty meat in it, but we just divulged it. And um, that was the best meal we have had for years. But I tell you, the night we sat on buckets with terrible tummy cramps because we just couldn't digest the food, it went right through us and several people were dead from eating because the body just didn't have the strength to digest this food. So from now on we had to realize how careful we have to be with food. But we were all obsessed with food. So um, then I decided I would go to Auschwitz. It was a, we were in the women's camp called Birkenau. Auschwitz was in walking distance to go to the men camp to see if I could find my father and brother. And um, so I went there with another French girl. My mother was too weak at the time. And um, we looked in all the barracks and I found two people who had known from Amsterdam. And one I barely recognized, but I went to him and I said, aren't you Otto Frank and his father? He said, yes, yes. Um, have you seen my daughters? Have you seen my wife? Um, I said, no, I didn't know you were in Auschwitz, but I've never saw them. And I asked, have you seen my father and my brother? He said, yes, I've seen them, but they went and left the camp with the Nazis. But at that time, luckily, we didn't know about the death marches. But you might remember Peter from the diary and his boyfriend. Um, he was as well there. He was actually with Otto for a long time. And he wanted to go on this march. And Otto said to him, no, do stay here. I'm sure it's safer but he wanted to go and of course he didn't make it. You know, you always had to make choices um, and most choices were not good. So, um, 
Then the Russian decided they wouldn't leave us, but we would, um, because there was still face passing, actually one day the Nazis came back. And um, so we decided um, we would go with the Russians east. And we traveled for four months with the Russian deep into Russia. Um, we, you can't imagine devastations we saw. Um, the Germans had burned down every town, every village, um, killed millions of people. The Russians lost 30 million people because most of the Second World War was really fought on Russian ground. Only later when the invasion was, was of course fighting with them um, in Italy, in France, in Belgium, the Americans and the British fought. But before this, the, there was no fighting in the Western Europe. And um, so um, you might have heard later how the Russian went into um, Germany and Berlin, how they looted and raped and did terrible things, but they went all there to revenge themselves of the loss of their own family and their own towns and their villages. But she treated us very, very well. They fed us, they closed us, and transported us to safety. Eventually, we ended up in Odessa, and there we waited for the end of the war. And when Hitler committed suicide on the 30th of April, and that really then the Germans um, signed a peace treaty. And then, of course, we realized we had made it. Um, did, did Anne's father travel with you, he traveled with the with Russians? Us this whole journey. But on the train journey, he met a woman who was there when his wife died. So he knew he had lost his wife, but he always said he had great hopes that his children would still be alive. And did you stay together with them after, after the war was over, together with Otto and... Um, well, we went eventually to Amsterdam, and um, we, we were able to go to our own apartment, but Otto, um, his apartment, somebody else had moved in. Um, there was a Dutch removal firm called Pulse, and that became a verb, this apartment had been pulsed. Because, you know, the German looted enormous amount of property and clothes and everything. Everything what they took from all the Jewish apartments when the people were deported, everything went to Germany. And um, so Otto had nowhere to go really, and he went to stay with Meep Gies, who was one of the helpers when the eight people were hiding. Um, we heard from the Red Cross um, after about four weeks that both my father and brother had perished in Mauthausen several days before the American army came to liberate that camp. You can't imagine how devastated we were. Um, you know, our life was really shattered. Um, a few days later, Otto came as well to tell us that um, he heard that both his daughters had died as well. He was really heartbroken and he looked terrible. And I sat on my mother's lap and we cried. And my mother said, well, at least we have each other. But this poor man, how can he carry on with his life? He had really nothing to live for. He was 57 already at that time. And a um, few days later he came again and um, he looked a little better and he had a little parcel under his arm and he said, I must show you something. And he opened it very, very carefully and I think you can guess what it was. It was Anna's diary. And this little book gave him a purpose in life. He always said, I feel as if my little girl is still with me. He opened it and he read a few passages, but he always burst into tears. And um, it took him several weeks for him to read the whole diary. At what point did you discover your brother's paintings? And, um, and, and what did that mean to you? Well, um, <clears throat> when um, Otto got the diary, and, um, because at first, I mean, we knew about, but you know, so much had happened and we were so living in a, in, in, well, you know, we were not thinking normally. But when Otto had the diary, um, my mother and me said, what about Hans's painting? We really have to 
tried to get them as well. We didn't really want to go there because this woman who had blackmailed them, you know, through her all this had happened to us. So we were very reluctant to go, but on the other hand we really wanted the painting. So we went to this house and um, we knocked very reluctantly and a young couple opened the door. And um, luckily this woman didn't live there anymore, she had disappeared. Actually she was arrested later as well and um, because she betrayed some other people. And um, this young couple, we told them that um, our family had been hiding in this house and they hid their artwork under their floorboard. And they looked for silly story, didn't want to believe it and um, they didn't really want to let us in. But I really start to cry and I said, look, just let us look, you can come with us, you know, we won't take anything. And people were very suspicious after the war. And um, so eventually they said, okay, well, just look quickly and um, you won't find anything anyway. But indeed the paintings were there. And that was, of course, really more or less the only thing we had left from my father and brother. Um, and do look at them, they are really quite amazing, of a boy of 16, 17, who just from his head did all those amazing artworks. Um, um, a few years ago, um, I thought if I'm not here anymore, our children will take a couple of them, but you know, as a whole collection, I think it is more interesting for people to see. So I donated them to a resistance museum in Amsterdam. I'm very grateful to the members of the resistance, many, many thousands of Dutch people who risk their life to help Jewish people and do other damaging things to the Nazis. So, and it's a beautiful museum to tell all the story about all those brave people, what they did in the war. And those resistance people were everywhere in all the occupied countries. They worked together with the British who sent um, parachuting weapons down and leaflets and radios and all kinds of things. It was really, um, over the whole of Europe, was a big network of anti-German activities. Can you tell us a little bit about your mother and Otto Frank? Okay. Um, well, um, I was very miserable, um, I hated everybody, and Otto came very often to our house. He was lonely, my mother was lonely, and um, he decided eventually to publish it as a book. And um, in Holland it was um, 1,500 books, it wasn't really a... Um, people were not, you know, after the war, people were not really interested to hear anything. And at the time in cinemas, when you went to see a movie, um, there was always, because we had no television, not, not everybody had the radio, so there was a newsreel. Um, and the liberation of the camps by the British, the Americans, the French, was shown in those newsreels. And those were unbelievable, horrific images. Um, heaps of bodies, skeletons, bulldozed into mass graves and horrible things. And um, when people saw that, um, I think there was around the world a, bit, a guilt feeling that perhaps they could have avoided if they had done anything about this, which indeed they could have done. But um, people then didn't want to hear any more about it. And um, so I really wanted to talk about it, but people didn't want to know, so I suppressed it, and then later when they asked me, I couldn't speak anymore. And so I was full of hatred and suspicion. I went to school, and Otto came to say to me, you know, if you go through a life hating people, um, you will be so lead such a miserable life, and the people you hate, they won't even know. So they are not suffering from that. And you know, there are some wonderful people around. Go out, put a smile on your face, and um, life will get better. You are young, you know, you have a whole life in front of you. But it's easier some than that. I missed my father and brother. And as well, I didn't accept it that they disappeared. You know, like I heard from September 11, if um, a husband or a son went to work and just didn't come up, come home, but you didn't really see he had died, people didn't want to accept it and believe it either. 
So, and it did happen for many, many years that people came back from Germany or Poland. And um, so I had always great hope and that made it even more difficult. And um, so Otto always came to us, my mother made him a meal and my mother helped him then with um, finding translators for the book in Germany and in French. And it was published in um, 1952 in America. Um, Otto tried many, many publishers, but nobody wanted to publish it. Eventually he found a publisher Doubleday who said, okay, I'm going to take a chance on it and publish a few thousand books. Well, I bet you all those other publishers are very sorry <laughs> because um, it became an immediate bestseller. Millions and millions of copies have been sold and um, seven of these languages it is translated and next to the Bible it is the most read book. So it was achieved by a 13, 14 year old girl. So it's really quite something. And um, so Otto came very often to ask help from my mother and they became very friendly. And um, when I finished school, I, I was still very miserable and um, I didn't know what to do. And Otto and my mother decided I should become a photographer. And I didn't really care what they chose for me and I said, okay. And Otto said, well, perhaps it would be good if you would go out of the country for a year. And um, so Otto knew somebody who had a studio in, in London. And I went for a year to London um, to become an apprentice in a studio. And I was shocked in London, you know, in 1951. So there was still very bad food rationing and um, the city was bombed and the English didn't have any money to rebuild. And it was really quite, and there was no food, and it was really very, very difficult. But nevertheless, the country had never been occupied, and I loved it. I liked to be part of this big crowd. And um, I lived in a little boarding house, and there was a young man from Israel who had come to study economics, and we became good friends. And um, after six months, we went always for long walks. We didn't have any money not even to go much to the cinema or anything. And um, one day he said to me, Eva, I love you, marry me, and let's go to Israel and start a new life. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because um, um, I like you, but uh, I have a widowed mother in Amsterdam, and after my year is over here, I'm going back to her. I wouldn't dream of leaving her alone. We were very, very close. And um, one day Otto came, he had some business in London, and I told him all that, and he said, you know, I have to tell you something. Your mother and me have fallen in love as well, and when you get settled, we like to get married. So this is what happened. We got married in 1952, and Otto and my mother got married a, mi a year later in 1953 and they were married for 27 years and I've never seen a happier couple. They really understood each other, they worked together continuously on the many, many thousands of letters he got from all over the world of people who had read the diary and wanted to know more, they wanted Otto to become their, their godfather and and they wanted to know um, their own problems, they told them, and they visited and they invited Otto and my mother. They were many times in America. Of course, there was a play and a film made. Um, they wanted Audrey Hepburn, Hepburn, to, Hepburn to play, but she didn't want it because she was as well born in the same year, 1929, and she was in Holland. She's actually half Dutch, which you probably didn't know. And she worked for the resistance, she smuggled when she was 13, she smuggled newspaper on her bicycles for the resistance, and so she said it's too close to her heart, she couldn't do it. Which is a shame, because she would have been really a beautiful Anne. Later she did um, um, a reading of the diary, with um, a music with uh, Michael M Tilson, um, um, famous American conductor. He made an ode to Anne, and um, it was performed, and Audrey Hepburn came to read parts of the diary, and I met her, and I said to her, you brought Anne back to life. She was the same type, and she did it so beautifully. It was really very, very, very moving. 
And um, um, we didn't go to Israel because my mother had asked my husband not to take me so far. At that time, um, you know, you didn't fly and it was very expensive to go by boat and so my mother didn't want to be separated from me for so for such a far country. So we stayed in London. We have got three daughters, five grandchildren now and so Otto had again um, grandchildren as well. Um, our three daughters were really his grandchildren and my, grand, my children really considered him as their grandpa. So um, this was really quite nice as we had again a family. I understand that you've been telling your story for about 20 years. Yeah, what is I, it that caused you to start I didn't, to open up? I didn't speak for 40 years. Um, I was shy, I didn't want to talk about it, and people didn't really want to know at the time, you know? But in 1986, you know, the Anna Frank house where the people were hiding has become a museum, and um, thousands and thousands of people, a lot of people from America came to see that, and um, the people in Amsterdam decided not everybody can come to Amsterdam, and so they would make a traveling exhibition. And that was made in 1986, and it came for an, it was an English version. Now they have it for in all countries. It goes all over the world. But at that time, the English version was the very first, and it came to London. And of course, my mother and me were invited. Otto had died in 1980. He was 91 years old. And um, of course, we were invited to this event and there were about two, three hundred people, which was for London a quite a big crowd at the time. And um, many um, people sat on a podium, on a head table, and um, the organizer said to me, come and sit with us here at the head table, which I did, not expecting, suspecting anything. And everybody spoke, and then in the end, um, he said, and now Eva will want to say a few words. Well, I can tell you I didn't. I wanted to crawl under the table. <laughs> but um, I got up and everybody looked expectantly at me. And eventually everything that I had suppressed for 40 years came flooding out. And they couldn't stop me. And um, that was for me really a watershed. From then on, um, I realized people were interested. People wanted to know and um, it moved to different cities and went to Leeds and Manchester and Aberdeen and they always asked me to come and open it and um, I had to make a little speech which I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't speak freely so my husband had to write a speech for me and um, I read it which wasn't very good because I was very nervous, I always had to take a tranquilizer before, <laughs> before I went up there. So, um, but you know, eventually I learned to speak, I learned to speak freely, I, I really felt I had something to say. And then people said, you know, you have really experienced so much, it's an interesting story yourself, why don't you write a book? So this is what I did in 1986, I started to write Eva's story, which came out in 1988. It was translated, not in 70 languages, but perhaps in seven or eight. Um, and it's still going, and um, this is a new American edition with an interview for me, so bringing it more up to date. And um, I think I speak on behalf of all of us that we're so thankful that you've been willing to tell this story. It's really a remarkable story. Just as we, as we conclude, perhaps you'd be comfortable touching upon, how do you feel about the current rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, the Holocaust denial that's becoming uh, more prevalent? Well, people in Europe, are, um, especially in France, where people buy apartments in Israel as a security, just in case. And, um, but it is, in England, for instance, there is anti-Semitism, but it is not really um, to the people who are, the Jewish people who live in England, but it is really more because of Israel. Um, many, many people, um, the English, the BBC is more, um, they always take the side of the underdog, thinking it's the Palestinians, and the propaganda is um, unfortunately more, the Palestinians are telling more about, they always show 
if a Palestinian person is killed, but never if a Jewish person is killed. And so people, um, Israelis or Jews, said all the same to them. So that's how anti-Semitism disappeared again. But you know, I do hope that people will come to their senses and find a solution in Israel and Palestine and make a two states. Everybody has a right for a homeland and um, I hope they can sort that out and then I think we won't have much anti-Semitism. So, um, but nevertheless, there are genocides in the world. There's, the situation in the Middle East is again pretty terrible. Many, many people are being killed. Governments are toppled and we don't know what is happening later. So um, we have to be careful. We have to be watching out. We have to be aware. We have to follow the situation very, very carefully. Um, just, uh, if you want to finish, I just would like to read the poem. But sure, sure. Something. Um, just, I know that everyone here is going to leave here, I mean, obviously very deeply inspired and is certainly going to uh, talk to many of their friends about what they experienced tonight. Is there perhaps a final message that you'd like to share with everyone, something that we can go home with, something that we can be inspired with? Well, um, I heard the inauguration speech of um, Obama and he said, which is really my message too, you know, we are all equal, there shouldn't be any racism, there shouldn't be any religious discrimination, and um, we should really help each other, accept each other, and um, try to create a more equal world. Um, you know, the differences between rich and poor has become just outrageously big. And um, of course, this is really, and uh, many jobless people, and this is really what it was in Germany in um, the 30s. And that is why people don't accept it, and that's why you get um, prejudice, because nobody wants to take the blame, no government wants to want the blame, no people want to blame, and so they try to blame it on a minority group. But if we work all together, to create a better world, all do our part, share with it. Um, hope the young people are wonderful. Two of my grandsons went in the went in the holidays to Africa to help in little villages. One went to put um, um, email uh, computer working in a little village. The other one um, worked on clean water for the villages. And um, I think from America too, many many young people go out to help other people in the poor countries. And um, I am an optimist. I think we will create eventually a more harmonious world. Amen. I would just like to... Not, not yet to <laughs> I would like to finish to tell you just a little bit something, just a few minutes, about my second book, um, The Promise. When Heinz was 12 years old, he was very much afraid of dying. And so one night he said to me, because we shared the room in Amsterdam, he said to me, um, what will happen when we die? Um, will we just disappear? And um, I said, well, I don't know, but let's ask our father who has all the answers. And um, so um, he went to my father and he said, Papi, what will happen when we die? And my father said, well, if you have children, you will live on in your children. And then this 12-year-old boy said, but what if I die before I have any children? And my father said, um, nothing gets lost. Everything you have done in your life, somebody will remember. We are all a link in a big chain which goes from generation to generation. I promise you that you won't be forgotten. Anna Frank says in one of her letters, um, when she dies, she would like to live on. Well, she has become immortal because everybody in the world, people know about it and her name is known, so she is not forgotten. But very often my mother said, what about poor Heinz? Nobody knows about him. And so I wrote this book to remember him, as of course, as well about Auschwitz, but as well about the strength of our family and what a wonderful brother he was, and it's a lovely book. And of course now we have the paintings, and um, many people in, in, in the Netherlands and from abroad go and see them. But he wrote as well, besides painting, and he taught himself six languages, um, he wrote about 100 poems. 
and most of them are in Dutch, but I had a couple translated here in this book, and um, a lot of them are quite sad, and i uh, just like to read you the last, um, this one to finish up. Don't cry, Mama. Mama, do I have to die already? I heard the doctor say so. Please, Mama, don't cry. Heaven is, heaven is such a beautiful place, and soon we'll be together again. Mama, what will my little sister say when she wants to play again? Please, Mama, don't cry. After all, I'll be seeing Dad again. He's been waiting up there so long already. Remember to take good care of the kitten. She loves me so. Please, Mama, don't cry. Do you still love me as much as ever? Are you still with me? Please tell me, Mama. The worst of it, Mama, is that you'll be gone so long. Please, Mama, don't cry. There's sure to be a window up there for me to watch you through. Please hold my hand for just a minute. It seems so misty in the room. Please, Mama, don't cry. Mama, just one more thing. Please kiss me goodbye. He was 16 years old when he wrote that. Thank you very much. Anybody wants to ask any questions? We have a few minutes for questions. Um, after we conclude the questions, um, Mrs. Schloss is kind enough to sit in the front, uh, in the front lobby, and sign uh, some of her books. So we'll just take a few questions now. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Is is there a question? Yes. Okay, thanks. What do you think about all these efforts that the German government has made to try to apologize for what they've done, to try to educate the children about what's happened, to try to change their society, um, and to try to learn from the experience? Okay. I'll just repeat the question for those who couldn't hear you. The question was, how do you feel about the efforts that the German government has made to apologize? Um, well, they have actually apologized, and they have done restitution for, um, compared to Austria, who hasn't done anything for many, many, many years. Austria said they were victims as well, which they weren't, of course. But um, they didn't teach, the only thing they didn't teach, they didn't want to talk about it. Only, I think, in the 80s, like everywhere else, the Holocaust has to be taught. Every child has to go in their school years. Um, to a concentration camp. So, um, you know, I think they have uh, taken responsibility now, uh, 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 already for a long time, actually. Yes? So, in addition to Otto Franks helping you to get over and transform the hatred in that you had, what did you have to do inside you to overcome that? 
I'll just repeat the question. What process did you go through to overcome that hatred that you felt? Um, you know, not like in America, counseling didn't exist in Europe. And um, even now it's not as popular as here. And, um, and you know, I just had to help myself, which I did eventually, you know, but it took me a long, long, long time. Yes? Have you continued your photography? Um, well, I was for many years a photographer, but um, later I, I had an antique shop. So, and, and lecturing is now my third profession. So I have... <laughs> <laughs> yes. During your time at Oxford, it seemed like such a horrible experience. What kept you clinging on to the what kept you going in Auschwitz? Uh, you know, I was, um, I was young, I was 15 years, like you perhaps, and I didn't want to give up life. You get one chance here on earth and you don't give this up very easily. So um, this was really, um, and you know, I had a very wonderful life. I was a child and I wanted to experience life. Uh, you know, I from nine years on to 15, I was, I was, uh, you know, suffering, and I really wanted to have a boyfriend, I wanted to get married, I wanted to have children, so I held on. Um, and I was one of the lucky ones. Yes? Speak up. Perhaps you can talk a little more about the travel through Russia after the war? After the war, after the Russians liberated you when you traveled through Russia? Um, it wasn't after the war. It was um, January 1944 when the war didn't finish till May. And that's why we couldn't go home. And the Russians took us away from the fighting, from the front, eastward. And we waited in Odessa, which is on the Black Sea, beautiful place, um, for the end of the war. And then we went back home. Okay, we'll take one more question. Go ahead. Sorry? Oh, what, what got you into photography? Um, well, it was Otto who um, wanted me to be a photographer, and I was working in commercial. That was the time when color photography came um, into being, and I did first a course at Kodak. and. Um, we had many clients for advertisement, but later I did, did portraits and children photography, and um, then I gave it up. <laughs> I never did digital. I did always my own developing and enlarging, and I enjoyed that, and I wasn't interested in digital. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.